their uh, a strong faith. How does that help you on a night like tonight? Um, it's everything. Christ's resurrection is everything. Not just his life, but his death and resurrection. You can only get that through him, the Holy Spirit only through him. No false prophets, no Muhammad, no anyone else. Only Jesus Christ himself. Power and finesse. Your calling card. The Holy Spirit. What, what, Acts, what? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Power, Holy Spirit power. It's everything. That's where it's from. Where'd the finesse come from? Holy Spirit as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mom and dad, maybe. <laughs> A little bit of both, but oh God. I'm put in perspective winning three of these in a row. In dominating fashion, by the way. I'm blessed. Um, God used me. He gives me this platform for this right here. To exalt. So that's all it's for. When I'm suffering, cutting weight, home from not away from my family. It's all for him, so it's all for his glory. Enjoy it. Put in the time and the sacrifices. Good Congratulations, way. Aaron. <laughs> Jeremy, I was trying to give you a chance to represent, man. Nittany Lions. So that, that's not the, there's obviously March Madness is going on, but that's not the only March Madness. Their wrestling tournament just concluded as well. And Aaron, what a great testimony that that young man just shared. And not surprisingly, he's coming under a lot of attacks, a lot of, uh, a lot of people lashing out against him. Why? Because he said, Jesus. Uh, he didn't do the generic post-game interview, oh, to God, God, you know, I just thank God. But anytime you mention the name Jesus, things get real. And then he was, and he was going a step forward, he mentioned the Holy Spirit, he's quoting scripture. So it, it shouldn't surprise us when people, when people react to that. That's the, the cultural pressure that we experience living in this world. Um, and that's what the people living in the city of Colossae was going through. And so we're starting a sermon series right now called Christ is Enough. It's a short sermon series on the book of Colossians. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to go ahead and turn there. It's in the New Testament. Uh, so you can open, you know, about halfway and go further to the back. It's after, you know, remember it's General Electric Power Company. So it's uh, Galatians, Ephesians. Uh, Philippians, Colossians is after Philippians. And this is one of the few churches that Paul is writing to that he didn't personally start on one of his uh, missionary journeys. In fact, uh, Paul hasn't even met these people. Uh, the guy that started this was Paul uh, discipled other men and worked with women to spread the gospel and to start churches all around the Roman Empire. And there was one guy named Epaphras who started this church in Colossae. And apparently Epaphras had visited Paul, and he said, well, what was Paul doing? Well, guess what Paul was doing? He was in prison, because Paul was always in prison. And why was Paul in prison? Because he was talking about Jesus. So the same persecution, the same lash out that Aaron Bruce is going through, Paul went through it as well, and we should expect that as well. But when Paul hears this report from Epaphras about the church in Colossae, he gets really exciting because God is moving among these people, but they are experiencing cultural pressures, and they are also being attacked from in society. And so Paul decides to write this letter to encourage them, to motivate them, to say, keep fighting the good fight. Trust the Holy Spirit to give you that power and finesse. And we'll get into more details next week about the cultural pressures that they were, that they were feeling. Uh, but right now, today, I want to talk about the encouragement that Paul sends them. And the book of Colossians is all about how Jesus is preeminent. He's number one. He's the main point. He is enough. It's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And, he, and the book of Colossians follows the typical Paul formula. He opens by introducing himself, then he prays for them, and then he talks about how awesome Jesus is. So we're going to follow that pattern today. I'm going to read the first verse to introduce it, then I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to talk about how, how awesome Jesus is. And before I do that, is there any way we can turn this down slightly? Because I'm getting a lot of feedback back here and it's ringing in my ears, and I'm getting very distracted. Um, and if it's this loud to me, I can only imagine what, I don't want you to feel like I'm yelling at you today, so. Randy is a hard, Randy's working hard back there. Thank you, brother. All right. 
This is how the book of Colossians opens. This is verse 1, and it's on the screen if you don't have your Bibles. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, one of the men that Paul was really investing in, that goes on to lead the church at Ephesus, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. And that's a typical intro from Paul. He always says it's grace and peace to you from God our Father. And normally he'll, like in Philippians and Ephesians, he adds on, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this one, though, he just says from God our Father, and there's a reason for that, um, because basically he's going to spend the whole, net, the whole first chapter talking about Jesus and how he represents the Father, but I'm getting ahead of myself. But grace is, grace, is the vertical indicative. It allows you to stand before God, uh, the, His grace, and then peace is the horizontal imperative. And basically what that means is anybody that has received grace from God should actively work to be peacemakers to spread peace to other people. That's what Jesus is talking about, about us being peacemakers. We have peace and we spread peace because we have received peace grace from God. So that's his intro. Then he prays for him. Then he talks about how awesome Jesus is. So now let's pray. I'm going to be using Psalm 13 today to pray. If you've been coming here the past couple weeks, you know what to expect. But basically we're, we're praying the scriptures where I will read a verse from a scripture, normally a psalm, then I'll pray over it, and then I'll read another verse, and then we'll continue to pray in that fashion. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you today humble. Lord, thank you for the grace that you have given us. We don't deserve it, but you give it to us anyway. Lord, we thank you for the testimony that we heard from Aaron Brooks, our brother in Christ. And just pray that those words, we know that those words are not empty. Millions of people saw that interview. Millions of young people look up to him, and old people. They look up to him and they say, what an amazing guy. And the fact that he spoke so boldly that Jesus said, you are the main thing. Lord, I pray that we will remember today that you are enough and that you are the only hope that we have for peace. And Lord, we need that reminder because sometimes we're not at peace. Even though we know We've received grace and we know we've received peace and we're supposed to spread peace. Sometimes in our hearts there's a, there's a tempest, there's a storm tossing us to and fro upon the waves. And Lord, when we, when we feel that way, I pray that we won't run away from you, that we will run to you, that we can join in as David did before in Psalm 13 where he asked, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. Lord, we thank you that you include this prayer in your scriptures. We can feel we can relate to the agony that David is experiencing. He can't feel your presence. In this moment, he's overwhelmed by the storms of his life. And Lord, there might be people sitting right here today or listening online that they feel the same way, that they don't feel your presence. But Lord, the fact that you include this prayer shows us that you want us to be honest. You want us to be genuine. When we're feeling sad, when we're feeling alone, we come to you. We seek you. Lord, we thank you for this example. And Lord, I pray that truth that will resonate in our hearts and minds that when we do struggle to feel your presence, that we don't just sit and wallow in self-pity, but that we actually seek out your face. We read your scripture, we pray, and we keep praying, and we keep praying. But Lord, we thank you that you listen to all our prayers, our prayers of joy, our prayers of agony. And we thank you that you care to listen. And Lord, David continues as, he, as he's expressed his agony, he's continuing to pray and he says in verse 5, but, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. Lord, believing in your promises while we're suffering, 
while we're feeling overwhelmed, it takes time. Lord, we ask you that you give us patience. Lord, we know that we must never stop praying. We have to keep praying. So, Lord, we ask you to give us persistence. Lord, help us remember the promise of this psalm that as long as we trust in your love, as long as we keep praying, that we will end up in a place of peace. Just like David did when he wrote in verse 6, I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Lord, help us pray until our hearts rejoice in you. Help us pray and seek you until our hearts rejoice in you. We love you, Lord, and I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable in your eyes. O oh, Jesus, our Savior, in your holy name we pray, amen. So now we pray and now we get to talk about my favorite topic. How awesome Jesus is. And in the New Testament, there's several New Testament instances where Paul is basically, Paul was very academic. You know, we don't think he was very artsy, but he must have been because in both Philippians and Colossians, there is a hymn where he's writing this basically poem or the symphony of words. And the one in Colossians starts in verse 15. And so let's look at verse 15. 15 with me. This is how he starts by talking about. Sorry, Randy's being distracted back there by Michael. It's okay. Michael's asking something. Uh, all right, here we go. This is why we need two people back in the booth. So if anybody wants to volunteer to be on the TET team, the person that was uh, the person that was supposed to be there today, uh, uh, she couldn't be there, and uh, she's okay though. I know she's fine. I'll forgive her. It's my wife. So. Uh, I know why she's there. Uh, she's not there because her her Great Dane is puking all over the place, and she needs to she needs to take care of her Great Dane. It's not my Great Dane; it's her Great Dane. So I was like, I'll go to church. You stay here and deal with that. Uh, no, I cleaned it up yesterday. Today's her turn. All right. So um, anyway, so we're so let's look at this hymn, this symphony of words that Paul shares in Colossians 1.15. He starts, and I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we'll come back, because this is just, this is some deep, awesome stuff. He's talking about Jesus here. He says in verse 15, The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. It sounds like what Aaron Brooks was saying, right? That Jesus is above all, you know. Um, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy that he deserves. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on a cross. So in this hymn, Paul is describing, like any great symphony, there's two movements. He's describing who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Who Jesus is, is he's the creator of all things. What Jesus has done is he's creating something new. All right, so the first part is how he, Jesus, created everything cosmologically. And now the second part of this symphony is Jesus is creating something new. But what is that new creation? Well, we'll get to that. But first, let's look at who Paul says Jesus is. He's using a lot of language, and you might not pick up on it, but he's quoting the Old Testament ad nauseum here. He's quoting Genesis. He's quoting Exodus. He's quoting Psalms. He's quoting Proverbs. He's taking all these Old Testament verses, and he's, he's blending it together to make this new, this new symphony of talking about Jesus' supremacy. And so let's start with that first part in verse 15. It says, the image of the invisible God. This is one of the clearest, this along with the way John begins his gospel, this is one of the clearest declarations that Jesus is God. That he's part of 
the Trinity. And he is the ultimate revelation of what God the Father is like. Because God is unseen. Um, you know, in, in Acts, uh, Paul is talking to the people of Athens, and he says the temple, he's like, I saw all the temples in your city, and there was one called the temple of the unknown God. Well, let me tell you who that is. It's talking about God, the creator. And so God is unseen, but God has revealed himself because God wants a relationship with his creation. He's revealed himself in multiple ways. Number one, he's revealed himself in creation itself. When you look at the stars and the vastness of the universe, that's God showing off. When you, look, when you listen to the, the audio clip that was released from NASA this week of how a black hole sounds, if you haven't looked that up, that's God showing off and that's the song of creation saying that, hey, you know, there is someone that made this. The mountains, the, 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 the changing seasons, everything that you like about creation, that's God showing off. So that's one way that he's revealed himself. And Paul in Romans says that if that's all you have, you have enough to know that there is a God. But he doesn't stop there because then he gets, that's what we call general revelation. Then God has specific or special revelation. And that's right here. It's one thing to make all these wonders, but if you don't speak and explain who it is that made it, then you can be lost and start worshiping false deities and whatnot. So don't let it, don't overlook how generous and gracious God is to actually speak. He's given us his words. And so that's the second way that God reveals himself. And then what Paul is saying is the ultimate way, the, the, the Creation itself, scripture itself, all these things have been pointing throughout from the beginning of time to right now. Everything's pointing to Jesus because he is the ultimate revelation of what God is like. That's why Jesus says, anybody that's seen me has seen the Father. And that's what Paul's saying there. He's the image of the invisible God. Some people will distort this second phrase, the firstborn of all creation, to try to say, well, Jesus isn't God because he's the firstborn. So that means that God the Father existed before God the Son. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in a trinity has existed from eternity past, will exist to eternity future. People get... Um, uh, tripped on, up on that and there's a couple of you know very well-meaning groups of people that they, they zero in on this and then they don't have a clear picture of who Jesus is and that's why if you get a knock on your door as Jehovah's Witness that's one of the ones that get tripped up on this. Mormons as well, they get tripped on this and if they, if you are trying, if you actually talk to them, which I enjoy talking to them um, because I want to share with them the truth because they're close the Mormons are close. They're so close, but they're missing the key part. So I enjoy talking to them. I don't, you know, some people don't feel comfortable with doing that, but I use it as an opportunity to evangelize. And one of two things happens. Either they come to know Jesus or they never come back. <laughs> so it's a win-win. And that's happened to me. I've been blacklisted multiple times. And they come, and the one, one guy, uh, this is off topic. Uh, one time... I was doing this, uh, this apologetic for why, they're, you know, why they were incorrect that Jesus is actually God because you miss the fact that Jesus is God that changes your Christology and that's pretty important. And man, they were, they were getting so befuddled. I think that's the right word. And so they leave and I was very generous. I wasn't like yelling at them. I was trying to have a conversation. And then five minutes later, they were back with their like supervisor guy that apparently is the bus driver. He's like, I hear you've been confusing my people. And I was like, hey, come on in. I'll confuse you too. <laughs> and then after that, I was blacklisted. They never came back. They were like, mark him off the list. So anyway, so I, but if you, if you do try to engage with them, their, their scripture translate, they, they change the translation and they, they misrepresent this. Firstborn of all creation doesn't mean that Jesus was created. It means, it's a Hebrew term, that means that he is, it's, it's a Hebrew term that signifies Jesus' royal status. 
He is the king of the universe. That's what it means firstborn of all creation. It means the preeminent one of all creation. So he is the king. He's the guy on the throne. And we know that it can't mean that he was created because of the, other, the second half of this phrase. And in Greek, it's actually the first half of this phrase. So that, let that throw your mind. It says that all things were created through him and by him. So if he created all things, that means he couldn't create himself. That means he has to just pre-exist. And I know I'm getting into the apologetic weeds, but this is important. It's important to understand, to have a high Christology, to remember who it is that we get to worship every day. And so why do you think that Paul would start off by reminding these people that are living in the Roman Empire that, hey, Jesus is king and is in control. Anybody have any idea why he might start there? I'll tell you. Because empire, by very definition, has who in control? An emperor. And the emperor of Rome was called Caesar. All right? And at this point, it was Caesar. It was not Caesar Augustus was dead. At this point, there was a very, very bad Caesar. And you've heard his name because he's so notorious, so nefarious, so... I ran out of I ran out of adjectives. <laughs> he was a bad dude. You know who it is? Nero. So Nero is the king of the Roman Empire, and he is abusing his power, abusing his power, killing people left and right, doing all kinds of sit things where he, you know, he's the one that fiddled while you know Rome burned. You want to know why it burned? Because he was burning people at the stake on the city streets, and it got out of control. That's why it caught fire. Because he was he was executing so many people by burning them alive. He was a terrible, terrible guy. But he's the one that, on the face of it, on the surface, it seems like he's in control. And so, if you're living under that bad of a ruler, and let that put it into perspective, everybody that's not happy with our government, which has many faults. At least they're not burning us alive on the streets yet. But, I mean, I mean, he was a bad dude. He made bad decisions politically, socially, culturally. It was bad. And so they're living in this climate of fear. But Paul's telling them, you have nothing to be afraid of. Because Nero's not the real king. The real king is Jesus. And the real king is in control. And even when we don't understand... Why he's allowing these sufferings to happen. Because these are Christians being executed. Even though we don't understand why he's allowing this suffering to happen, Jesus is still in control. I think that's useful. That had to be encouraging for the Colossians to hear. And I think it's important for us to remember. Not politically. Because politically, you know, it seems like it never stops. We're already on to the next election. You know, whether you like the president, you don't like the president... There's going to be another election and you can vote against him or vote for him. They were stuck with Nero until he died, which he did eventually. I think it's important for us to remember because we are living in a time of the modern self. We're in a postmodern society, and so we've really put forth the idea of the modern self. And what this means is our individual needs are preeminent. What I want, what makes me happy, what makes me comfortable, that's number one. And I have to put that before everything else. You decide for yourself what truth is. You decide for yourself what paths to follow for your passion so that you might be happy someday. And, and you decide the modern self. You have to become a self-actualized individual. Have you heard people talk like this? And I'm not, you know, I'm just saying that this idea of you determine for yourself what is true, what is right, that is dangerous. Because here's the thing, you can't trust yourself. You can't trust yourself. There are moments where you think this is absolutely the right thing for me to do, and then what happens two days later? You regret that you ever did it. Because you can't trust yourself, because we are emotional creatures. And our intellectual capacity is sometimes clouded by our more immediate emotional needs. My best friend, his name is Matt Smith, and that's his real name. It's not like a pseudonym. That's his name that his parents gave him, Matt Smith, the most generic name ever. He'll tell you. He's the lead singer of a, of a band called Theocracy. And 
somebody asked him, why did you name your Christian band Theocracy? Are you trying to establish a, you know, a God-ruling government? He's like, no, that's stupid. He's like, the, the reason he wrote a song about it, and you can look it up on Spotify if you like heavy metal. If you don't like heavy metal, skip it, but it's still really good. You can just read the lyrics. He says, he, so he wrote a song because he was like, he, I kept getting this, this question over and over in all these interviewers. Why are you named Theocracy? This is back during uh, uh, the Bush presidency, uh, 40 uh, w, w. Bush in the early 2000s. And they, they kept, you know, back then they were, oh, George Bush is trying to set up a theocracy. And is that what you're doing, Matt Smith, if that is your real name? He's like, no. So he wrote this song, a title track for the first album, and he says, basically, and I love this, and this helps me when I am getting in my own way, when I need to remember that Jesus needs to be preeminent and not me, that I don't need to become a self-actualized person because I am made in the image of God and I'm a blood-bought son of the living God. And this is the lyrics that he wrote. In the center of my heart, there sits a throne that the rightful occupant is not free to call his own. All right, and so, so he's saying that in my heart, Jesus is supposed to be on the throne, but I don't let him sit on the throne because I'm always trying to take over. And so the, whole, the chorus then says, I take the crown, my crown, and I cast it down. You know, and because in that moment, you're submitting to Christ's lordship. That is something we have lost. I really, really liked what Melinda said last week, where she said that sometimes we have taken, sometimes we are worshiping a watered-down, westernized version of Jesus that we keep in our back pocket. That's not Jesus. Jesus is the king of the universe and preeminent, and to really follow him, you have got to take your crown off and cast it at his feet and submit to his lordship and say, I don't want to sit on my throne. I don't want to sit there. Jesus, I want you to sit there because I trust that you want what's best for me. The last description in this first movement of who Jesus is, it says that he is before all things and through all things hold together. Through Jesus, all things hold together. When I say, and I say a lot of the times, it's all about Jesus. It literally is. Jesus created everything for himself. And everything is ultimately about him. And that would be narcissistic if it was anybody else, but it's not. It's Jesus. If there's one person in the entire universe, in the history of the universe, that should be the center of attention, it should be Jesus. It's like the author of the story wrote himself into the story as the main character. And he's not just the main character, he's the main point. And the story, it keeps going. The story keeps going because Jesus is not just the originator of the story, he's the sustainer of the story. All things hold together through him. Think about that. You can go cosmological with this, the black hole that I'm talking about with the gravity and the stuff and the light not being able to escape it, you can say that Jesus wrote the laws of physics that makes that happen. The fact that the earth rotates just right and is on the right angle and goes the 365 around the sun. 365.14, I know, I know. All right, so, you know, because the leap year, whoever came up with that is like daylight savings time, but regardless. All right. He sustains that. He wrote those laws. You can go cosmological all that, like that, that Jesus maintains the universe with just a thought. And it's not even he has to think about it. It's not like, huh, should I let the earth keep spinning? No. It's he set it up and he just sustains it. And it's just amazing when you think about the power that Jesus has. Because, I mean, think about it. I can't even keep my house clean. And yet Jesus is keeping all of this going, the entire universe, the vastness of space, working perfectly. But you can also drill down to, that's the cosmological view, you can also drill down and think about how he sustains you individually. The words I'm speaking right now, how my vocal cords are modulating so that you can hear the sound, that's Jesus. The oxygen that you're breathing, the way your lungs the, or the way your lungs, the blood's coming and the blood's going to your... Uh, that's him. That's Jesus. It's mind-boggling. But Paul is saying that's who Jesus is. And that's why Jesus is worthy of worship. That's why Jesus is worthy for us to actually step aside and let him take control. Because when we are in the face of that, 
How can we possibly compete? And the fact that he would want to be involved in our lives, the fact that he would want to sustain us and empower us and give us the Holy Spirit, that right there is the grace that we just read, we read in the first verse. That's the grace. Why would Jesus do that? He doesn't need us. But yet he chooses us. Think about that. That's so different than any other relationship that we have. Because the healthiest relationship, you still need the other person. Jesus said, I don't need anything. But yet I still choose to be involved with you. I still choose to love you. I still chose to die for you. And I choose to make you into my new creation. Because that's the new... Remember we said there's two movements. Who Jesus is, he's the creator of all things. And what is he doing now? He's creating a new creation. And that's you. If you are a follower of Christ, you are a new creation. This movement starts in verse 18. And I know I read over it before. I want to read it one more time. So verse 18, if we can go back to that. And Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything that he might have the supremacy that he deserves. I add that part, but that's the implied thing. I want you to notice the parallels of these two symphonies. The first part, what does Paul say? Born of all creation. Second part, what's he say? He's the firstborn from among the dead. So what's he doing here? He's trying to show you that at the cross, everything changed. Because not only is Jesus the king of the universe, he's now, he ushered in this new age, this resurrection age. He started it. He inaugurated it. He's the firstborn from the dead. He rose in the promises just as he rose from the dead, we will rose from the dead as well. And I think it's fascinating when we think about all the power that Jesus has spended to create the universe, the cosmos, all those gravitational laws, the physics laws that we were talking about. He's now using that same power to make the church. Think about that. The church, you, me, them across the street, them up the road. The church... In all his variations throughout the world, he is using the same power to sustain us and make us. And I'm not talking about a building. I'm not talking about a temple. I'm talking about a people. We are a new humanity that Jesus has created and bought for himself. He's like, I don't need anything, but I really, I, I want these people. And we're like, Jesus, why do you want us? We don't, we're not worthy. He's like, yeah, but I love you anyway. You know, I want you. You're a new humanity. And so then the surrounding verses, not in the Christ hymn that I read, but in the surrounding verses, you see how does Jesus make this new humanity? There's three verbs. There's three verbs that's used in this passage that describes what Jesus did for his new creation. And they are, he reconciled us, he rescued us, and he qualified us. And these three verbs show us why we don't have to worry about being the so-called self-actualized individual that is the ideal of secular humanism. Because the Bible says we're so much more than that. Not only are we created in the image of God, we're image bearers. Not only are we blood-bought sons and daughters of the king of the universe, but we are so much more. We're so much more. We are co-heirs. Co-heirs to this new resurrection age, this new stage of humanity that Jesus is creating. He's made us into something so much better and we can't even comprehend it. We won't be able to fully comprehend it until we get to eternity where he makes all things new. So let's look at each one of these verbs briefly. I do mean briefly. You're like, yeah, right. I'll believe it when I see it. I promise. Reconciled is in verses 21 through 22. And this is what it says. Once you were alienated, you were separated from God, and you were enemies of God. You were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. That's his diagnosis of our state. But now, 
I love those words. But now, Jesus has reconciled you by, well, God has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish, without accusation, free from accusation. Where's the accusation coming from? The enemy? The one that hates you, that wants to destroy you? The one we've talked about? The accusations, it comes from yourself. You beat yourself up because of the past mistakes that you made. And what he's saying, he's reconciled. He's like, all of that is wiped away. This is legal terminology. This is courtroom terminology that Paul is using. He's saying, basically, you were guilty. The verdict was in. You had no hope. But now, Jesus has taken that guilt away, and guess what? You're not guilty anymore. It's not that you're on parole. It's your record has been expunged. There is no record of your guilt. No more, you're not guilty anymore. So don't beat yourself up over past mistakes. That's where the attacks come from. You say, oh, well, Jesus can never love me because you don't know what I did. Trust me. Jesus loves you. He knows what you did, and he still loves you. He still loves you. He knows how you ignored him this week. He still loves you. He's still here for you. So you don't beat yourself over, up over past mistakes because you're no longer guilty. Rescued. Rescued is in verse 13. For Jesus has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. See, we were, we we're part of the problem. We, before Jesus, were part of the problem. We're not only our evil minds, our behavior, but we are in the dominion of darkness and he brought us into the kingdom of the son that he loves. Now this, the first one is legal terminology. This is hero terminology. This, the Greeks, the Romans, they love their superhero stories. You know, we think we, we love our comic book movies. They had mythic mythology, their superhero stories long before us. And every one of them had this hero that would save the day. Because we are being held captive. We're in the dominion of darkness. We have chains on. We're behind bars. And he, this is basically saying that Jesus is coming in. It's a prison break. He's kicking the door down. And he says, come on out. The prison's gone. And the chains fall away. And so now we're rescued. And now we can walk free. I and mean, this is just like any type of great heroic story where, you know, the poor village people are, are huddled together and they're starving and they're in chains. And then here comes your... Whoever, you know, I don't know who, Conan or Captain America, whoever, he kicks the door down and everybody's free. He's like, come, come on down, you're free. Jesus broke through and he saved us. And here's what's so, so sad. is that he rescues us. And in the movie, when the hero breaks in and rescues, what do they do? They all jump up and they run out. Oh, thank you, superhero. Thank you, Superman. You know what? And they run away. And then they go and they live in the village and they get away free, right? But that's not what we do. Jesus free, he breaks the door down and says, you're free. And we go, I don't know if I want to leave yet. I kind of like the dominion of darkness. Or we run out and we get out and we're like, oh, I'm free. Whoa, wait, wait a minute. I'm supposed to submit to Jesus. I'm supposed to give him my first fruits. I'm supposed to do what he tells. I don't know. I'm going back into the jail. What sense does that make? But that's what we do. Jesus frees us and we're clamoring to go back to this dominion of darkness. We should be ashamed of ourselves. But guess what? Remember, we're reconciled. Jesus knew we would do that, but yet he freed us anyway. And he's still saying, you can still come on out. Come on out. You're free. Don't go back in the dominion of darkness. There's nothing there for you. It's dark and scary. We're in the world but we should not be part of the world. We should have the courage like Aaron Brooks has, like other people have. When given an opportunity, we proclaim our faith in Jesus. And when everybody turns on us and everybody says, how could you? We just say, hey, Jesus is preeminent. He deserves it. And you can hate me. You can curse me. You can take away whatever endorsement deals you want. But I know that Jesus is worth all of that. Our pro if, we are in, if we truly want to follow Christ, our priorities must change. They can't keep being the same old priorities because we're a new creation. Which brings us to the third verb, qualified. Qualified in verse 12. And this, is what, this is how our priorities should change. Giving joyful thanks to the Father. 
joy, thankfulness to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. You're in the dominion of darkness. Now you're in the kingdom of light. Qualified means to make adequate or to fit. It's medical language. So we have legal language, hero language. Now we have medical language. It's basically like Jesus is operating on us. He's, he's reconciled us. Our guilt's wiped away. He's freed us. We're not in the prison anymore. We're not captive. But now he knows his people still need him to change us. So he puts us on the table and we go under and he operates on us. And his tools that he uses, not a scalpel, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Because we're being operated on, the Holy Spirit's working in our lives to root out all that sin, to root out all those evil thoughts that he referenced to root out that tug that the dominion of darkness had on us. It's an operation to repair. It's literally remaking us. Making all things new. That's what's meant by a new creation. This phrase right here, qualified, this, meta, this it's only used twice in the New Testament. And when something's only used twice, you kind of go, huh, that's interesting. Where's the other occurrence? Well, I'm glad you asked. The other type is in 2 Corinthians 3 says. 2 Corinthians 3 says. And this is when Paul is describing the impact of being part of the new creation, being under the new covenant. And it's not just the privileges that we have. We've talked a lot about what Jesus has done for us, the privileges that we have, our guilt's been taken away, we've been freed, we've been operated on. But it's talking about the responsibilities we have. If we're going to be a citizen in Jesus' kingdom, there are responsibilities that we have to have, our priorities have to change, like I said. The Colossians knew exactly what he's talking about. Because anybody living in the Roman Empire, for all its faults, with Nero's evilness, Rome and Greece before them, which Colossae was in the Greek region, Greece before them, they understood that to be a citizen meant that you had great privilege, but you also had great responsibility. That almost sounds like an other superior thing. With great power, there must also come great responsibility. So with this new covenant, there is responsibility. So how does a new citizen... How does a citizen of this new kingdom of light live? Well, Paul tells us in this passage, in Colossians 1, he says, working backwards, we should be patient. Remember when we were praying through Psalm 13? Ask for patience. Why? Why do we need to be patient? Because in the moment, it can look like God's not at work. Especially when you're suffering. But just like we saw in Psalm 13, as long as you keep seeking God, as long as you keep praying, you eventually wind up in the place of peace. And how does David end that? David starts his prayer in agony. He ends the prayer how? Rejoicing. So you've got to be patient. We have to persevere. We have to persevere. You are going to be attacked. If you're following Jesus, you're going to be attacked verbally. You're going to be called names. You're going to be discounted. Don't be, Jesus says, like, why are you surprised the world hates you? The world hates me. If he hates me, he's going to hate you. The world is going to hate you. Let's become okay with being uncomfortable in the world. We should not expect the world, including our American society, to cater to our Christian wants and desires. Because guess what? All the people making those laws, they need Jesus just like we need Jesus. And so we don't want to like force society as a whole to try to fit in the box of what we think it should because that's not how it works. We should be persecuted. And real persecution is not what we're going through. Our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, that's persecution. The one that right now in Africa where the church is growing humongously or in China where the church is growing humongously, somebody could kick that door down right now and either arrest us or kill us in a moment. That happened today. 
I don't know what village it happened in. I don't know what city it happened in. But Christians died this morning because they were together worshiping Jesus. Let's remember that. And let's not feel too sorry for ourselves when somebody says something bad about us. Let's be like Aaron Brooks. He's like, I don't care. Because that guy can take it. <laughs> Guess what? We have the power of the Holy Spirit. We can take it too. Does that make sense? So don't think, don't try to, don't try to make yourself some type of victim. Expect it. And Jesus says, if you are feeling that way, that's a good sign. It's not a bad sign. It's a good sign because you're actually following in my footsteps. So we have to persevere. We should also grow in the knowledge of God. We should be reading our Bibles. We should be in a Bible study group. We should be in a discipleship group. We need to be growing. And we should be bearing fruit. That can look so many different ways for different people. But when you are peacemakers, when you're sharing the gospel, when you're being faithful to sacrifice and to be uncomfortable, that's bearing fruit. If we do these things, Colossians 1.10 tells us that we may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way. Shouldn't that be our goal? We talked about everything that Jesus did for us. Shouldn't we want to live to please Him? He's a good king. He's a good king. And we're not doing this to live a life worthy of the Lord. We're not doing this to earn our salvation. That's not the whole... That's not, if you walk away from that, from today, listen, oh, I've got to go out and live better, you've missed the point. Jesus has already reconciled you. He's already rescued you. He's already qualified you if you're a follower of Christ. And so now you live, you bear fruit by you know, having your life be an act of worship. That's what He's made us to do, to worship Him. And the, and the most astonishing news, of the, whole, the most astonishing impact of this symphony that Paul has created, this Christ hymn, is that Jesus' new creation is not going to end like the current creation. The current creation, the cosmos, is eventually going to end. It's called entropy. It's eventually going to end. Things are breaking down. It's going to end. The new creation doesn't end in death. It doesn't end in entropy. It prom Jesus promises that the people that trust him to reconcile, rescue, and qualify themselves before God, they, we, those people, we survive the grave and we are resurrected with him. That's why Paul says he's the firstborn from among the dead. When we believe this gospel truth, when we really believe it, when it's in our heart of hearts and we know that it's true, we no longer need to fight to win or survive. We can just focus on loving other people instead. Because we put other people before us. Because we're already reconciled. We're already rescued. We're already qualified. But there are millions of people in this world today that are not. You have neighbors. You have family members. You have coworkers. You have classmates that they don't know Jesus. They don't know these truths. And so we should live in a manner worthy of the Lord to allow those people to see, hear, and respond to the gospel. The fact that Jesus is king, that Jesus loves you, and Jesus died for you. And this new creation, we as a church, and this is why it's so important to come and gather together as a church body is that when we are, when we're singing, when we're studying, when we're praying together, we get to experience a taste, just a taste of the way the Lord's Prayer ends on earth as it does in heaven. Just It's a preview. It's a trailer. If you were here last week, you got a taste of it. You felt the Spirit moving. You felt lives being changed. I hope you felt the same way today because anytime that we focus on Jesus anytime we are worshiping alongside one another, that is showing us how great it's going to be when we all get to heaven. Even when we're in the midst of the storms, even when we're suffering, even when we don't feel God's presence, don't give up. Remember these truths. That God loved you enough, Jesus loved you enough to die for you, so that you can be reconciled, rescued, and qualified. Remember that and keep praying. Keep praying. Let's pray together now. Jesus, we love you. We're in awe of you, what you've done, who you are, what's the fact that you've called us to be part of this new creation. 
Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here or listening online that does not know you, Holy Spirit, that you will convict right now, that you will break through whatever, whatever stubbornness is in their hearts to remake them into a person that calls out, Jesus, I need you. I can't do this on my own. Lord, as we wrap up today, I pray that you have been honored. I pray that you've received glory. And I thank you that we get the opportunity to worship together through singing and through studying and listening to someone as in, insufficient as me. I just, I know that my words are not enough, but God, your truths are. So Holy Spirit, I pray that something that was said today, that was read today, will resonate in hearts and minds so that we can live in a manner worthy of the gospel that we profess in submission to our Lord, submission to our King. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Let's stand If you, could, you can be seated. We're going to wrap up with a few quick announcements. We worship through singing. We worship through studying. Now is the opportunity to worship through giving. We do think that this is a way to, to show Jesus' preeminence, the way we do change our priorities. It's, I, can tell you how, well, I can tell you what your priorities are. It's how you spend your time and your money. That's, how, that's what your priorities are. And so for members, regular attenders, this is an opportunity for us to show our priority that we do want to give back to the God that gave to us. And so if, you want, if you've come prepared to worship that way, if you want to do it in person, there's a black box right through those doors, or you can always go online. And some of you, speaking of online, some of you may have noticed the website's down. Don't worry. It's part of the transition. And so if you give online, you can go to our Facebook page. That's where the link is there. If you've already set up a recurring gift, it's still coming out. It's all good. The website will be back up later this week, so there's nothing to worry about. Now, if you are a guest, uh, I would encourage you and invite you to maybe take, instead of giving, uh, your gift was being here today. 
And we appreciate you hanging out with us and worship Jesus. But we also have these Net Steps cards that's in the pew in front of you. If you're, if you're a guest and feel so inclined to fill this out, to let us know you're here, that'd be awesome. On the bat, if there's something you need prayer for, uh, that would be something to fill out. And you can put these cards in the same black box. Now, some of you who've been coming here a long time, members, regular attenders, there are next steps that you feel like God is telling you to take. And you're not taking them. And I don't know why. All right, but if, Jesus, if God is convicting you that there's a next step for you to take, I encourage you to fill this out, and I will be glad to talk to you about that. Now, a couple of quick announcements. We talk about giving, but there also is a way to give through your time, um, through serving. And so we call this faith in action. And there are some ways to put our faith in action. I'm going to run through a couple of them. You can always find out this, this from our information station, if you haven't noticed it. I know that's the lamest name ever. That's why I chose it. I love, that's so lame. The, bill, the bulletin board out there is our information station. You can see upcoming events. You can see ways to serve. We got a couple of ways to serve coming up. Uh, before I get to the ones that are on the slide, uh, if anybody likes helping people move, you know, maybe somebody is strong or really likes moving people. Uh, there is a young lady who's in a bad situation that needs help moving. And uh, she reached out as a coworker of mine. And she reached out. She's like, I know, is there anybody at your church that could help me move? And I was like, sure. I'm sure there might be somebody. And she was supposed to move yesterday, which I could have helped yesterday, but I can't help this coming Saturday. But this coming Saturday, April 1st, not April Fool's joke, all right? Uh, she's going to be moving. That's something you're willing to do, you know, to spend a morning or something helping somebody. I mean, she's got a couple of people. She was hoping for two, two more, two or three more people. And it can be anybody, men, women, children of all ages, anybody that can pick up a boss uh, or the other side of the sofa. If you're interested in that, uh, see me and I will, or use this either way and we can get you connected. Unfortunately, I won't be able to help this coming uh, Saturday. I will be out. I will be elsewhere. Uh, but there are two slides that you can see up here. Uh, Project Egg, roaring success. Thank you so much. All the plastic eggs have been filled. There are still some, some um, slips of paper that Amber was hoping to create kind of like um, door prizes. So on her table out there, there's these sheets of paper. The idea is you take one, you go and you buy a cheap gift, five bucks or something. You know, it's probably the same amount you would spend on the candy you put in the ads. And then bring it back is kind of like a door prize thing. I think she said less than $10, actually. So um, if that's something you're willing to do, uh, please pick up one of those and bring it back a week from today, April 2nd, because our Easter outreach is two weeks from now because Easter's two weeks. This coming Sunday is Palm Sunday and we're going to be doing the Lord's Supper, something to look forward to. It's always a good time. Uh, but then the next Sunday is Easter. And so we're doing our Easter, our Easter outreach the Saturday before, so that's April 8th. That's going to be from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then the other way that you can serve, and boy, is this fun. <laughs> Operation Light Bulb Replacement. James, isn't this fun? Yeah, he loves it. This is fun because you get to work with, you get to work alongside, you get to be in the presence of the man, Larry Logan, and the legend, Donnie Underwood. And we're looking for somebody to fulfill the role of the myth so we can have the man, the myth, and the legend. I'm still looking for the myth. Uh, Randy, maybe that's you, buddy. What do you think? Yeah. But anyway, they've been doing a great job replacing light bulbs. Man, the progress they've made is unbelievable, and we're doing this to save the church money. And so there's still, if you're willing to help in that regard, uh, they, they do have a fun time. And, um, and there's not just the wiring. You can help other ways. Uh, say, Donnie was like, just having somebody running back and forth so he doesn't have to climb up and down the ladder is a huge help. And I know this, hey, it's spring break. You've got some free time. Especially, you know, some of you teenagers, you're, you know, let's stay out of trouble. Let's come here and work with wiring and stuff. That'll be fun. Oh, you're, you're getting old. You need help? Is that what you said? Okay. Larry, we know you're old, man. It's all right. All right. Anyway, I think that, uh, is that the last one, Randy? All right. So we're going to wrap up. I don't think I'm forgetting anything. If I am, sorry. I didn't write it down. And when I don't write things down, Normally I forget something. So we're going to end up how we always do with a benediction. This is a promise from the Word of God spoken to the people of God. And this is from Romans. And this is short and sweet. But I think, it's, I think this is super powerful. 
And I'm going to read the verse leading into it. Um, I'm going to change the wording a little bit to make it an imperative. But then I love this verse. Because we were talking about earlier how sometimes we feel defeated. This is what Paul says in 16, Romans 16, 19. Let your obedience be known to all. Be wise about what is good. Be innocent to what is evil. And here's the short and sweet one. I love this. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God loves you, church. Go in peace.